west side. Wow, there's lots of you today. Look around at this room. This is a good problem. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're smarter than I thought you were for coming today. Yeah. I'm Dan Sutherland, one of the pastors at Westside. We're thrilled that you're here, whether you're joining us at Lenexa campus for four services or up at Lansing for two or up at the Speedway for two or, wow, all kinds of times you can catch it online and people that are doing that around the world, we're grateful you're here. I want to start with some really good news today. How many of you were here last week and heard me talk a little bit about our orphan kids over in India? Yeah? I invited you to respond that we need 60 plus sponsors. Guys, not only did we fill the 60 kids in India, we filled all the kids who needed sponsoring in Thailand and South Africa. We have a sponsor for every kid that we have right now. Go God. I love it. That absolutely rocks. We've had some other great news this week. We had our first Get Connected class or classes of 2012. 158 people came through those classes to join up with Westside this week. That's a, that's a record. Never had that before. <laughs> Grateful for that as well. And you know that we've been receiving our impact commitments through December and January. Let me give you the report as it stands right now. We have $615,000 pledged. Last year we pledged about that same amount, gave over $754,000. We're anticipating that will be the same this year as well. So we're grateful for that. One of the things that your impact giving does, your giving beyond your regular giving, is it helps us do things out outside ourselves. And last year, we teamed up with two other churches, Olathe Bible Church and Restore Community Church, to plant the first new church in Kansas City that's ever been planted from three different denominational churches. That's just never done. And it happened this year. In fact, New City Church opened on January the 8th. Matt Miller is their lead teaching pastor. You've heard Matt speak here. We've got a minute and a half video of their first Sunday we want you to see. Check this out. Hello, Westside Family Church. My name is Matt Miller, the lead pastor of New City Church. And I just want to take a quick moment to tell you thank you for being so generous towards New City Church. On Sunday, January the 8th, we launched our very first service with 322 people. Here's a quick video so you can see what we experienced on our very special day. New City is meeting in what was the old Dollar Theater at Neiman and 75th. If you've not been in that building since they've moved in and fixed it up, it is amazing. They are reaching folks right and left. We're big time proud of them. One other piece of news. We're announcing today that in 2013, hopefully about this time of year, January or February, we're going to be launching a new Westside Family Campus in Johannesburg, South Africa. That's because uh, we've got two young guys, South Africans, that God has brought our way. We're going to send somebody from our team as well. And uh, we're pretty pumped about this first formal entry into a campus setting that is international in nature. Now, guys, all of that is happening because you're being generous. All of that is taking place because you're learning what we already know. You can't outgive God, but it really is fun to try. I bless you for that. How about a hand for God? Can we do that? He does all right. Okay, find your notes and let's dig in. If you don't know, we are purpose-driven note takers. There's an insert in your material today. In fact, we're not going to let people out of the room unless they have all the blanks filled in today. 
That's mostly a joke. So write some things down. We have a theme for the year called Red Letter Revolution. We're looking at the red letters, the things about Jesus, the things Jesus said, the things that tell us what he did. And we're studying them verse by verse from the Gospel of John. This first series in this new year is called Knowing Jesus. And for eight weeks, we're now in week five, we're talking about this new idea. Write this into your notes. The big idea for the series, knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing him. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing him. You can know a lot about him, all the facts, all the figures, all the stories, all the details, and still not know him. And we don't want to run that risk that anybody's depending what they know about God to mean that they know God. So we're unpacking this idea in this series. Week one, we looked at the fact that Jesus is God. Week two, he's creator. Week three, Pastor Brian taught us on he's the light. Last week, we talked about he's the incarnation. If you weren't here, I encourage you, go online and check it out. Here's the direction we're going today. It's the first numbered blank in your outline. Jesus is the giver. Jesus is the giver of life. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is the one we're going to look at today, John 1, 12, and here's what it says. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. I want you to circle three words, gave the right. Gave the right. Jesus gives the right to be part of of his family. It's an invitation only deal. He invites people into his family. We have a tradition at the Sutherland House we've kept for 20 plus years, and I'll confess, early on I pushed this tradition on my family, but it's now part of what we do. Every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, we invite people who would otherwise be alone on the holidays to come into our family and to be Sutherlands for a day. Now, a day of being a Sutherland is about all you can take. But they come in and they eat with us and they party with us and and we have time together. And and this year at Christmas we invited several. Only two came, Gary and Doug came, but they ate enough to make up for all the others. And we had a great time and we had some gifts together and some, some kid time together. We even sat around out on my porch and shared a fire together. They were invited to be part of our family. Check this out. You don't get into God's family without being invited. Jesus gives the right to become the children of God. And according to this verse, he will give it to anyone who will receive him and believe in him. Now, why is he willing to invite us into his family? Because it's the nature of God to give. That's what he does. This is how God showed us his love among us, 1 John says. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. God wants to give life to all. John 10, 10 says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus' plan is to give life to anyone who will receive him and believe in him. But there are two extremely dangerous false beliefs that I want us to spend some time on today. And you probably have wrestled with these yourself at some time in your journey with Jesus. Write these in. Here's the first dangerous false belief. Everyone is a child of God. Everyone's a child of God. I hear this one on talk TV. I hear this one on talk radio. I hear this one from all kinds of religious folks. Here's the way I usually hear it. We're talking about different religions or different ways to get to God or different beliefs. And somebody will look straight at the camera and smile and say, well, you know, we're all the children of God. No, we're not. Not according to Scripture. We're all the creation of God. A rock is a creation of God, but he's not a child. A horse is a creation of God. He's not a child of God. We are all his creation, no doubt. But Jesus says that you have to receive him and believe in him, and then he gives you the right to what? To become 
a child of God. That's literally what the verse says. When we receive him, when we believe, then we become his. It is a given right. It is a right that Jesus passes out. Here's the second dangerous belief, even bigger and more widely spread than the first. We can earn our way into God's family. We can earn our way in. Now, let me give you parentheses to put after that. Just like you put, we're all children of God by the other one, put this in parentheses by this particular point. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a pretty good guy. That's how this goes. You remember a couple weeks ago, I told you that I'd learned in seminary, excuse me, I always do that, seminary, <laughs> a 45-minute approach to presenting the gospel that included 42 Bible verses, way too much overkill. But it started with two excellent questions. One of the questions was this, if you died today and you stood before God and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to him? Nine out of 10 answers that I got had something to go do with this. I'm a pretty good guy. You know, I've, I've, I've done some good things. I've kept most of the rules. I hadn't killed anybody. I'm not near as bad as some other people in the world. I think God will probably let me in because I'm a pretty good guy. Let's have a little fun. Pretend that there's a ladder on this side of the platform and, and it reaches from earth to heaven based on how good somebody is and Billy Graham is climbing this ladder. Billy Graham. Everybody know Billy Graham? Greatest evangelist of the 20th century, maybe of all time. Billy Graham is climbing that ladder based on how good he is. And the ladder on this side of the platform has Mother Teresa climbing it. Based on how good she is, we're going to see how far she can get from heaven, from earth all the way to heaven. Now, I don't have a Mother Teresa joke, and if I did, I probably wouldn't tell it. <laughs> but I have a Billy Graham joke that's kind of bad, but I'm going to tell it anyway because I don't tell jokes real well. I tell funny stories. I don't tell jokes. Let's give it a shot. Stories told, it's a joke. It's made up, okay? <laughs> that Billy Graham is going out for a drive one day, and Billy's had bad eyes for years. He doesn't drive anymore. He has a chauffeur that takes him everywhere. That part is very true. And on this day, the chauffeur was not feeling real well, but he showed up for work anyway, and Billy noticed he wasn't looking too good. And he said, what's up? He said, well, I'm just feeling kind of nauseated today. He said, tell you what, you ride in the back. I'll drive today. The chauffeur says, are you sure you hadn't driven in years? Yeah, I've been wanting to drive a little bit. So Billy gets out and starts down the interstate. Evidently, Billy Graham has a bit of a lead foot because he's speeding, and soon the red lights show up, and he pulls over. And the officer comes up and asks for his ID and his registration, and Dr. Graham gives it to him, and he goes back, and he doesn't know what to do. I mean, he's just, he's just got Billy Graham for speeding. In North Carolina, that's like the fourth member of the Trinity, guys. You know, Father, Son, Spirit, Billy Graham. So he calls his, his chief and he says, Chief, I, I don't know what to do here. I, I've got two people and I've never caught anybody like this before speeding. He said, well, who do you have? He said, well, I, I don't know who the guy is in the back seat, but I think it must be Jesus because Billy Graham is driving for him. <laughs> Be here all week, but I'm bumps. <laughs> Think about the ladder of goodness that might get you to heaven and how far up that ladder Billy Graham might be. Think about a ladder of goodness to get you from earth to heaven over here with Mother Teresa climbing that ladder. You ready? How are you doing compared to Billy Graham and Mother Teresa? On the I'm good enough to get to heaven ladder, how are you doing? The Bible says they ain't that good. Billy Graham is awesome, even if he speeds. He's not going to get to heaven based on his goodness. Mother Teresa did more good for the orphaned and the abused in her part of the world than anybody in her generation. The Bible says she's not good, of us. good enough. None of us are good enough. We don't get there by being a good guy or a good gal. How do we get there? Look at your notes. Salvation is a gift that Jesus gives to those who receive him and believe in his name. You have to receive him and believe in his name. What does it mean to receive him? Write this in your notes. To receive Jesus is to deliberately 
accept him. My wife has been in North Carolina for two weeks taking care of the grandbabies while our daughter-in-law is finishing nursing school. Two weeks is too long. I don't do well. I'm not a good bachelor. Don't pretend to be. She came home this week. But while she was gone, UPS attempted <coughs> to deliver three sets of books to my house for her. They're copies of Mary's new book that's come out, and they wanted to deliver them. I wasn't there. They didn't deliver them. They left me a note. They tried a second time. I wasn't there. They didn't deliver them. But they left me a very interesting note. We're going to attempt this a third time. If you're not home to receive and sign for these books, you'll need to come pick them up. I decided I'd be there. I didn't really want to go after them. So it worked out well. They brought them a third time. I had to sign for them. I had to sign that I had received and accepted the books. The way you spiritually sign up with Jesus is you say, I'm deliberately receiving and accepting you. I'm signing in Jesus. Now, can salvation be a process? Absolutely. You can believe and believe and believe, and there comes a point in time where you cross the line of faith to where you truly do put your faith in Jesus Christ. But the Scripture says that happens when you receive him, and choose to believe in his name. It's a choice. It's a choice. I had to sign. I have to sign up with Jesus. I got to say, I receive you, and I believe in you. And what does it mean to believe? It means to put your life in his hands. Jesus, I'm no longer trusting being good enough. If Billy Graham's not going to make it, I'm not going to either. Jesus, I am no longer thinking that we're all your children just because you made us special. Jesus, I choose to believe in you. Jesus is the giver of life. You ready for a paradox shift of gears? Here it is, second point. Jesus is also the gift of life. This is a bit more abstract. Stay with me. See if I can explain it. I have always wanted to be married. I grew up in a very married home. My dad and mom have now been married 60 years. Long time marriage. And that's impressive in this day and age, isn't it? I think so. Mostly it's impressive my mom has put up with him for 60 years, but it's going well and it's a neat thing. I just grew up thinking it'd be cool to be married. Now, I'll be honest with you. Part of that was I like women. I mean, I had some guy roommates in college and that didn't attract me at all. I like women. Another part of it was, I don't like to be alone. I mean, honestly, these two weeks that Mary's been gone, I'm a horrible bachelor. House looked awful. I did clean it up before she came home. <laughs> Not that dumb. Actually, I hired somebody to clean it up before she came home. <laughs> Can't lie in church. I've always wanted to be married. And when I met Mary, I thought, she's cool. This is going to be awesome. Somebody to spend life with. I mean, I was in love with the idea of getting married, and I got married. And now, 36 years later, I realize the greatest gift was not being married. The greatest gift was Mary. It was my wife. That's the coolest part. She's the gift. Then I wanted to have kids. I mean, think about it. Kids that you can tell what to do, and they're always going to do it. <laughs> kids to mow the yard. Kids to do the chores. Take out, give me kids. Kids has got to be great, right? And we had kids. And I thought, man, it's awesome being a dad. But you know what I've learned since? The gift is not being a dad. The gift is Jared and Dana. The two kids we had who are absolutely two of my favorite people in the world. And check this out. Not only are they great kids, they married two great kids. I now tell people I got four kids. My son married Jody in North Carolina. I'm in love with her. She rocks. And Dana married Sam. I am not in love with Sam. 
but I do love him, and he's awesome, and God has just given me this idea that it's not just being a dad that was great. It's these four kids that I get to parent, and you know how I feel about being a granddad. It's the best thing there is. I'm so excited about being a granddad, but you know what the cool part is? It's not just being a granddad. It's being Jaden and Lelia's granddad. And it's being Justice Granddad. And it's being Granddad to a new baby that's going to be born in April. <laughs> you know, for a guy who wasn't able to biologically produce kids, my two adopted kids are really fertile. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor. When I first came to Christ, I thought it was about missing hell. And it is. I don't want to go to hell. When I first came to Christ, I thought it was about being saved. It is. It's about having your eternal destiny secured. That's important. But the longer I am with Christ, I realize Jesus is the gift. The gift is his presence in my life. The gift is his purpose. The gift is, is his companionship. The gift is Jesus now, am I thrilled I'm not going to hell? I really am. Am I thrilled to know that I'm going to go to heaven, I'm saved, my eternal destiny is done? Yes. But the best part of this gig is who I get to do life with. So he is the giver of life, guys, but he's also the gift. And sometimes we forget that. Just like sometimes in the middle of marriage, we forget our spouse is the gift. And sometimes in the middle of parenting, we forget the kids are the gift. And sometimes with grandparenting, no, we never forget it then. <laughs> Check out the scripture. In Jesus, in him, we live and we move and we have our being. That's not just being grateful to being, to being saved. That's, that's gratitude for who we live with and in and through. In John 1, 4, but Ryan talked about this a couple weeks ago. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And I love John 3, 16, but I think we've missed some of the point of it from time to time. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We often read this verse, most quoted verse in the New Testament, and we say, God loved us enough, he gave us eternal life. He did, but you just missed the biggest part. Look at what it says. He loved the world so much that he gave, circle the next five words, his one and only son. Jesus is the gift. He's the gift. This is where we have missed We've talked to people so much about, well, don't you want to settle your eternal destiny? Well, yeah, sometime. And we've talked to people a lot about, you don't want to go to hell. Nobody, I've never met anybody says, yeah, hell sounds good. <laughs> never have. But we've missed talking about the greatest gift of all. It's Jesus. It is an amazing, amazing thought. Write this in. Jesus wants to give you more than life. He wants to give himself to you. Not just life. That's what it means in John 10, 10 when it says, I've come that you might have life, but have it more abundantly. Have super powered, super energized life. How do you have that? It's life with Jesus. Here's the big idea. The God of this universe wants you, and he wants you to have him. That blows me away. That the God who created all the stars, all the galaxies, every world that is, knows my name and wants me. And he wants me to have him. That's more than just salvation. That's more than just missing hell. That's a relationship with God himself. All I have to do, write this in, is receive him and believe in him. I'm going to ask you to quietly put your notes aside. We've deliberately left time today for a time of response and prayer and for a time of worship. So keep your attention right here. Can you do that? Look this way.
Why are we spending eight weeks focused on Jesus? Because he's like this huge diamond that every time you turn it slightly, you see it in a different light. Every time you turn it again, there's a new facet. Every time you turn it, it's just, it's just like new vision. He is the giver of life, but he is also the gift of life. And here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer that anybody who wants to move from knowing about Jesus to knowing Jesus can pray with me. It's that spiritual sign-up moment. It's that, yeah, the spiritual UPS is delivering the stuff, and I got to sign it. I want to receive him. I want to accept him and believe in him. We're going to pray that kind of prayer in a moment. But then following that prayer, we're going to have a time of worship. One of my favorite hymns of all time is the one we sang part of earlier, Jesus Paid It All. The beauty of that old hymn rings to me. So while we're singing that hymn, I invite you to think about Jesus the giver and the gift of life. Here's what I'd like to do as we pray together. For those of you that have already given your life to Christ, will you pray for those who are doing business with God right now? Because you know what a big thing it is. And for everybody in the room, would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? If you'd like to pray a prayer spiritually signing up, receiving Jesus, stating your faith in him, you can pray silently when I'm going to pray out loud. Wow, Jesus. You are the giver of life, and you are also the gift. What a thought that you know me and want me and want me to have and know you. Right now, Jesus, I'm receiving you. I choose to accept you. I choose to invite you into my life. I believe in you. Thank you for giving me life. Help me discover the gift that you are. Forgive me for my mistakes, Lord. Help me live in a way that honors you. I receive you, and I believe in you. I make this prayer in Jesus' name.